Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 702 of the podcast and it is Friday the 7th of July 2023 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to John Gaspard about writing tips from the movies, how he started out in low budget movies and saw the parallels to indie publishing so jumped right in and his craft tips around exploiting the unique, using conflict in different ways, writing endings and cliffhangers as well as making sure you read and understand the fine print of contracts and of course tips for getting your book made into a movie or TV show. So that's coming up in the interview section. So in publishing and book marketing news, well, the big news this week has been the launch of Threads, which is Meta's competitor app to Twitter. So I have been, and of course, this could turn into book marketing news. (laughs) Now, I've been on Twitter since 2009 and have remained on it, even as things have clearly become difficult in many ways. Now, I still get most of my AI information from Twitter. I still love it, but it feels quite tech focused to me. And that's my feeds, my algorithm. And it has been the site I felt most at home with for over a decade, but it's not serving my books anymore. And so I've been looking for an alternative that is text based. Now, I didn't fancy Mastodon. I do think anything named after an extinct dinosaur doesn't really have the right vibe for me. I considered Blue Sky or just nothing at all, but I am pretty interested in threads. Now, it is essentially text first, although you can post pictures and video, and this suits me absolutely. So I am at JF Penn author. I will be threading or whatever it will be called. Some people are calling it stitches or stitching. Uh, so yes, but it will be related to my mainly my fiction brand. So that will include some writing craft stuff, but mainly research, photos from life, architecture, yes, um, gothic cathedrals, graveyards, cultural stuff, reading books. I'm reading general interaction around that side of me. It also links to Instagram, where I am also JF Penn author. So yes, you can follow me on Instagram or threads. <laughs> now I'll keep my Twitter at the creative pen focused on AI, self-publishing, etc. But I'm, I'm pretty excited about how this might go. Uh, it's also distributed. So this means it will be compatible with open networks, not to get too technical, but it means your data won't be locked within one app. It will be portable and it's built on the same protocol as Mastodon. So what I guess the kind of envisioning in the future is you'll be able to port between these systems or however, but essentially it was easier for them to build another app than it was to backwards re-engineer everything uh, that exists around Facebook and Instagram. And of course, it's another example of everything changes. You cannot cling to what used to be. So I've been on Twitter, as I said, for 14 years since 2009. I have over 85,000 followers and it has helped me meet people, certainly in the early days. And many of my very good friends I met on Twitter. It has been a great way to connect with like-minded people, first in the author space and then in the creative AI space in recent years. I still love it. I'm not leaving. (laughs) But as I think about the next next 15 years, it's actually quite good to start again. Start again with a new site, a new app, train a new algorithm, knowing what I know now, to put out a different side of me in a more consistent way and to curate what I share. Now, we all understand, we all understand a lot more about how social media works these days. When I started tweeting in 2009, it was still all pretty new. We didn't really know how these algorithms would shape how things happened. So, you know, we just 
kind of invented how things might work and they've emerged over time. And now we understand a lot more about how social media plays into branding and our identity as authors and how to, yeah, kind of curate the algorithm so the right kind of people see us and the people we want to connect with and just the, the messaging we put out there. And yeah, as I said, none of us really understood that at the beginning of social media. So my Twitter really is interesting, <laughs> but quite all over the place. Now, I guess we don't understand how threads will shake out, but the early days are a good time to help shape the future of a site. And it's all very happy and positive at the moment. So uh, more change, of course. I'm not saying you should get on threads. Maybe you're very happy on TikTok or LinkedIn or Instagram or Snap or whatever you use. I'm just saying I'm happy that there is a text first platform emerging. I had this awful feeling a few weeks ago that I might have to get on TikTok. But thankfully, threads has come along. And I feel like this could be a great place. I'm also pretty happy with the way Meta is integrating with Shopify. So I'm really hoping that at some point I will be able to link my store onto threads. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm just very interested in how this might shape out. So I wanted to mention it. So I am uh, at JF Penn author on threads. You can thread me or stitch me or whatever it's going to turn out to be. And why I wanted to say this is because this episode will be hilarious in a couple of years time when it's settled down and we know what it is. And it'll be like, we didn't even know what language to use at the beginning. So, or you can still tweet me at the creative pen with a double N. Yeah, so there you go. That's the sort of latest in social media. Who knows what it will turn into? So in kind of AI futurist news, I wanted to recommend two podcast episodes for you today. First of all, the Possible podcast, which I think is great. It really, the kind of premise is what will happen if everything breaks humanity's way. So as in, if anything, uh, you know, does amazingly well, what is the possible way of the future? This episode with Ethan Mollick, dated the 5th of July 2023, is great. He is a professor and teaches at Wharton, so he has some great insights into how to think about AI in education and also goes into how to prompt chat GPT and other models depending on how experienced you are. He gives a kind of if you're just starting, if you're intermediate and if you're more advanced. Um, so that is the possible podcast also, if you want to broaden your horizons about how crazy things are really getting with AI-powered uh, technology, because I feel like we're in this bubble of writers and creatives and we get obsessed about certain things, whereas there's some really big stuff going on in the world. Uh, also, if you want to get some ideas for science fiction, I, I certainly was like, oh my goodness, have to write this in a story somehow. Check out the Moonshots and Mindsets podcast with Peter Diamandis, who uh, this week interviews Ben Lamb from Colossal, a synthetic biology company that I've been following for a while now. I'm really interested in synthetic biology, but I don't talk about it really on this show or in public because it doesn't relate at all to what I do, but I think it's fascinating. Um, they talk about de-extinction and how it can save the planet. Yes, bringing back the woolly mammoth might just stop the polar ice melting and save us all. It really, it's like seriously listening to it going, wow. And they talk about exterior wombs and all this kind of stuff. So really, really interesting and far bigger deal than anything we're doing writing stories with AI. But around our area of AI, earlier this year in April, episode 683, I had intellectual property lawyer Catherine Goldman back on the show talking about AI and implications for copyright. She has now published an article around the guidance that the US Copyright Office have given. And because of the amount of misinformation I see blatantly flying around the author sphere about AI, I recommend checking it out. Uh, it's at creativelawcenter.com, links in the show notes as ever. She goes into a lot of detail and really worth reading, but essentially says, if you use AI technology to create work, you can create, you can claim copyright protection for your contribution to that work. Your contribution to the work must be appreciable. If your contribution is de minimis, the work is not protectable. Conversely, if the contribution of AI is de minimis, the Copyright Office is not even interested in knowing about it. So it, this di uh, difference between appreciable and de minimis is really interesting. And Catherine goes into this. She says it's basically fuzzy. 
<laughs> and it's a continuum, but definitely worth reading. Um, and this is why, you know, I say things like, well, my mid-journey images are de minimis for sure. I just put in a prompt and here's an amazing picture. <laughs> So I would never claim copyright protection on that. Uh, I treat it a bit like the stock photos that we all use. Uh, we don't have copyright over stock photos. We use them. And then we have copyright over the finished work for our covers, which are um, made up of lots of different things. And uh, yeah, so but my text, the way I'm kind of collaborating with AI for my books is totally there. There's just no way you could say that it was um not appreciable. So yeah, I think this is really interesting. I'll link to that in the notes. So in personal news, it's actually pretty funny because I recorded this interview with John a few weeks ago. And even though in it, I say I will never do another screenplay, <laughs> it must have put the idea in my head because a few years ago, I did do some screenplay courses. I wrote a few screenplays. I interviewed lots of screenwriters on the show, including David Nichols, who wrote One Day, which was a pretty big deal uh, a few years ago. Um, he did the adaptation of the book that he also wrote. And this week, I just felt the creative urge to turn Catacomb into a screenplay. So it's with my editor still um, as I record this. But I just was like, Do you know what? When I did that screenwriting course several years ago, I adapted my Map Walker trilogy. Well, at the time, it was the first book or two. Uh, I adapted that. And I was told by this agent, uh, he said, look, this is too expensive. No one's going to make this. You're an unknown uh, writer. Write a cheap horror film. <laughs> and at the time, I, I didn't have any cheap, short horror films available. Uh, but now I do. <laughs> I have Catacomb, which I have turned into a screenplay. And I, so this week, and, and I don't know, I am intuitive. I had an interview with Becca Syme, uh, must have been last year now. She's got a fantastic book about Are You Intuitive? And I am an INFJ in terms of my Myers-Briggs. So I, I am an intuitive and that's how I kind of do things. <laughs> follow my intuition and my muse. I don't really know how it's going to turn out. This screenplay may never go anywhere or I might pitch it uh, at the London Screenwriters Festival next year or I don't even know. Pff, who knows? But I just felt the need to do one. And so I wrote that this week and it was actually really fun. I think uh, and this book, Catacomb, really suits it's just a linear story and it is, yeah, it's the kind of the movie Taken meets Beowulf set in the catacombs under Edinburgh and it's super linear and very clear format. So I thought that was funny because I basically say I'm not interested in doing that and then a few weeks later I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Lean into your intuition, I say. I'm also building out my new Shopify store, jfpenbooks.com, which isn't live yet, but it will be soon. And that to separate out my fiction, I'm, I just love it. I really love the site. It's a different theme. It's, uh, yeah, I'm just really happy with it. And I've, so I've been going through and getting reviews, adding them to the books page. I've got loads of ideas for what I want to do. And with the emergence of box sets from Book Vault and merchandise and, oh, there are so many things I'm ex excited about. And uh, yeah, as I said, I'm also kind of excited. That's why Threads is interesting as a social media platform because of the integration already with Instagram, with Facebook ads, with, um, yeah, potentially with Threads. So yeah, I'm hoping I'll be able to tag products like Instagram does at the moment. Also, I wanted to let you know if you are French or French speaking, <laughs> I will be speaking uh, in English in Paris this October at the Indie Author Conference uh, in France. This is Paris, France, Americans. <laughs> uh, the conference is organised by Jupiter Phaeton. And uh, I'm not sure what I'm speaking on yet, um, but it is at the Trocadero in October. If you're French, Indie, or want to come, it will. the conference is mostly in French and um, maybe I'll have a translator or something, but who knows? I shall be there. I'll link to the site. Uh, so if you want a ticket, you can go. I think they're almost sold out. Uh, it sounds quite exciting. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments. Uh, at Loves Nursing on YouTube said about the Armit Gupta pseudo write episode, very good podcast, informative and helpful for editing and how to make things sound better is how I look at AI. It's not without flaws, but it opens the mind when it's blank. I find it very useful um, find it very helpful to use it for my next round of fixes before going back to the editor. 
And Gladys Strickland says, I remember when you put out your first nine AI disruptions episode. I cannot believe it's been four years already. Thank you for sharing up to date information about AI and how it can improve our writing. Thanks also to Brian, who sent me photos from Fairview Lawn Cemetery, the Titanic gravesite, which is really interesting. And yes, I will be sharing photos of cemeteries and Gothic architecture on threads uh, and or Instagram. And okay, remember, you can tweet me still at The Creative Pen. Send me pictures of where you're listening. Email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. Leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's episode is sponsored by draft to digital which I use to publish to libraries, Nook and other stores, and also to publish my co-written book, The Relaxed Author, with Mark Leslie Lefebvre to take advantage of the auto-payment splitting, which is fantastic if you're co-writing. I will play a word from Kevin Tumlinson in a minute. This type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time, especially all the AI extra stuff, is sponsored by my patrons. It shows me you enjoy the show and want it to continue as we head onwards. I guess we're heading towards 800 now. (laughs) A way to go. Who knows when I will make that, but I'm I'm pretty re-engaged with the podcast. I think you can probably tell. I am especially grateful to those patrons who have been supporting for years and also months, and thanks to new and returning patrons this week, Barb Rima, Laura Redfern, C. Nev, and Joshua Brecht. If you support the show on Patreon, you get my extra monthly Q&A for patrons only, and that is around 45 minutes of audio where I answer your questions on writing craft, publishing, book marketing, making money, writing, AI, futurist stuff, and more. You can support the show with just a few dollars, euros, pounds, whatever your currency is. And yeah, you'll get the backlist as well of the Q&A. So hopefully that's useful. You can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, I'll play a word from Draft to Digital and then we'll get on with the interview. Hi, this is Kevin Tomlinson with Draft to Digital. Ebooks are amazing, but there's just something about having your book in print. The crack of the spine, the weight and feel, the smell. Ah, everybody loves a good paperback. And that's why we built D2D Print. It's the easiest way to get your book from pixel to print with just a couple of clicks. We take care of you with free layout templates and formatting, and we can convert your ebook cover into a full wraparound print cover automatically. And if you run into trouble, we're just an email away with all the author support you've come to know and love. Come check out D2D Print and all the cool tools we've built for you. Find more at d2d.tips slash creative pen. That's pen with two N's. John Gaspard is the author of Mysteries and Nonfiction Film Books, a podcast host and film director. His latest book is The Popcorn Principles, a novelist's guide to learning from movies. So welcome to the show, John. It is so great to be here. I'm such a fan. I'm going to try not to fanboy out on you it, <laughs> oh, because you the so podcast much. has been so helpful for me as I've gone along this journey. You do a great job. Oh, well, I appreciate it. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and filmmaking. Sure. I was given a uh, what was called a regular eight camera, which was a wind up camera when I was a teenager. And I started making movies and those grew into feature length movies. Even as a teenager, I was making things that were 90 minutes long with dialogue and sound and all that. And I quickly learned that if you're going to make movies, you have to write movies. You have to know what it is you're going to shoot. And so I started learning how to screenwrite. I was very lucky right out of high school to be able to take some screenwriting courses from a guy named Frantisique Daniel, who was one of the founders of the American Film Institute and a really good screenwriting teacher. And I just started making low budget or no budget feature films where I would write, I would shoot, I would edit, I'd direct. And as it turns out, if you're going to be a novelist, that's a really good way to learn how to write a scene and how to structure something, how to put pace into what you're doing and only write the things you need. Because when you're writing a screenplay, if you write a scene you don't need, that means getting up at 5 a.m. and casting it and shooting it. And it's a real pain when you get into editing and find out you didn't need it. A little bit easier as a novelist. 
because you don't, you can just hit, you know, delete and you're done. So I did low budget movies in my spare time and worked for about 30 years in the corporate world, producing videos and meetings and events. Did some writing for a TV series called Lucky Luke, which was very big in, in Europe. Took all that I'd learned about making low budget movies and then interviewed about 60 filmmakers and put out two filmmaking books. And over the years, I actually spoke to probably 100 or so filmmakers. And then I segued into writing novels because it was a little bit easier. Making low-budget movies is uh, there's a lot of lifting involved and a lot of early mornings and late nights. So I'd always planned when I got into my close to and into my retirement years that novels might be a way to go. And as I was learning how to do that, I realized there's just a lot of crossovers between creating a low-budget movie and self-publishing, more so today than ever before. The paths you go down to do each of them are quite similar. And I found that there were a number of things that I was doing as a novelist that were based on things I'd either learned from making a movie or I'd learned from interviewing filmmakers about their movies. And one of the things that I'd learned in my corporate life, listening to business speakers, there was a guy named Joe Calloway. And Joe Calloway would talk to different companies about how to improve what they were doing. And he would use examples from other industries. And he would always end up by saying, what's your version of that? And that's what I'd been doing with the things I'd learned in filmmaking was I'd look at an idea and I go, okay, what's my version of that in the world of novel writing? And because of that unique crossover that I have between those two worlds, I've been asked to talk about about it a lot, and I put together a lot of notes on it. And that became the book, The Popcorn Principles, which is 25 ideas that filmmakers use that you can adapt and adopt for your own novel writing to make them better. It's not going to, you're not going to learn how to write a novel from the book, but you are going to get some ideas, I think, on how to make your novel better. Yeah, well, I, I like the way you've set it out. They're quite short chapters, but they cover a whole load of important stuff. So we're going to pick a few of the craft things and we're going to come back to the business side. But from the book, you say, exploit the unique. So what do you mean by that? And how can we find those unique aspects that can help our book stand out? Yeah, I always think that people downplay what's going on in their own lives when it comes to writing, that everybody has something that is unique about them that they should add to the book because it, it's unique to them. I have a songwriter friend who wrote a song years ago about a breakup and it became one of her most popular songs. And I asked her why. And she said, I don't know. The, these aren't song lyrics. They're a police report by which she meant it was something very personal and very specific. And because it was personal and specific, it became universal and people loved this, loved the song. And so you, you have to ask, well, what's my version of that? What do I have? that is personal and unique, that will make my story universal. In the book, I quoted Jasper Ford, who's one of my favorite writers. He writes the Thursday Next books and other great comic fantasy books. And he said, and I'm going to quote him here, readers are interested in the way a writer sees things, the unique worldview that makes you the person you are and makes your novel interesting. Have you ever met an odd person? Sure. Ever had a weird job? Of course. Ever been to a strange place? Definitely. Ever been frightened, sad, happy, frustrated? You betcha. These are the nuts and bolts that construct your set of your novel. And I looked at movies that had done that same thing, that had made it very personal and had kind of, by doing that, created something that everybody was interested in. There's a, a well, the most obvious example is Clerks, the Kevin Smith film from the late 90s, where Kevin worked in a convenience store and dealt with odd customers all day. And he wrote a movie about working in a convenience store and dealing with odd customers. And it was a hit because it was very personal to him but everybody could identify with it. There's another filmmaker named Tom DeCilio who wrote and directed a movie called Living in, Ob Living in Oblivion. And that was the trials and tribulations of a film director in a low-budget movie. And it was basically what had happened to him on his last movie. So he had very specific things in it, but because they were specific and real, they were universal and people glommed onto them. And then there's all this idea of just stuff in your everyday life that you should be taking notes on. From the movie world, my favorite example is George Lucas. When he was editing a movie before Star Wars, I don't think it was American Graffiti. I think it was THX 1138. He was working with the editor, and the editor said to the assistant editor, I need real two dialogue two, meaning he wanted the real of edited dialogue from the second reel. So the second reel, the second dialogue track. But that's not what he said. He said, I need R2-D2. And George Lucas went, oh, that's an oh, that's interesting. 
So he just pulled something out of his life. Another fun movie example is I had a chance to talk to Dale Lawner. Dale was the screenwriter for My Cousin Vinny. And in My Cousin Vinny, Joe Pesci and Marissa Tomei have a really interesting relationship in that throughout the movie, I don't want to say they argue, but they debate on any point that one of them raises. Did you turn off the faucet? Yes, I did. How do you know? And they drill down to it. And that becomes an important feature at the end when she's giving her testimony. And I asked Dale Lauder, how'd you come up with that relationship? And he said, I didn't. It's just two friends of mine. That's the way they are. And I love that. And I took it and I put it in the story. And we all have that. We're just not maybe willing or looking to take that out of our own lives and drop it in. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I guess people worry about uh, putting people they know (laughs) into their writing and so kind of avoid that. The other thing that springs to mind is that many of us have a lot of books. So I'm currently writing a book, which is like novel number 20 or whatever it is. And uh, I feel like in our beginning books, there's a whole lot more of that. And then as time goes on, maybe our imagination yeah. stretches or things change a bit because we do use a lot of of what we know. Yeah. So, I mean, how does this spin into like a long running series or that kind of thing? Well, I think it just comes down to being observant. I mean, you're right. You tend to, I, I remember hearing a screenwriter talking about how hard it was to write her second screenplay because the first one was, she said, it was like going to a cocktail party and telling every great story and being a hit. And then at the second to- cocktail party, you've run out of things to say. But it's just really a question of, well, A, letting your characters grow. That's a huge part of it. And also just constantly being on the lookout for for what's going on with me? How can I use that? I mean, when I wrote the second book in my Eli Mark series, I was at the time kind of out of the blue experiencing these weird panic attacks having to do with being in a situation of height, being anywhere near a balcony or anything like that. Don't know where it came from. Glad it went away. It was a pain while it was going on. But I absolutely used that because it was something that I could write about effectively and realistically. And it was also a great little twist for Eli that all of a sudden he has to deal with this along with everything else. And no one has ever come up to me and said, boy, was that you? Did you have that? Nobody cares. They just want to read the story and enjoy it. So it's just a question of constantly being alert to the things around you that would help your stories and asking yourself, what's, what is my version of that? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things, uh, one of my favorite shows is Succession, which I know is a kind of popular among some people and other people just don't care for it. But I consider it one of the most violent shows on yeah. TV. I have an interesting family, <laughs> various relationships. <laughs> and it is, I mean, the family relationships in Succession are the conflict. They are brutal. But it, compare it to a horror movie or something with a huge body count. And that's not what we mean by brutal. But in right. terms of conflict, Succession is all conflict all the time. And you say in the book, if you don't have conflict, you don't have drama. So can you suggest some ways we can add more conflict regardless of the genre? Sure. And first off, I have to say, we tried succession and gave up because it was just so mean. Yeah. And we went, (laughs) you know, yes, there's a certain degree to which we can watch things that are horrible. I remember James Blatch said, you've got to watch Happy Valley, but beware, it's grim. And I went, all right, well, it's called Happy Uh, Valley. How how grim could it be? Yeah, I couldn't watch Happy Valley. It's a ride. It's not a Happy Valley, as it turns out. They're being sarcastic about that. (laughs) Um, You know, TV and movies are a really good way to learn about how to create conflict, particularly when you see it done, I don't want to say badly, but when they do it lazily. We're currently working our way through the Inspector Lewis series right now. And I've noted, as has my wife, a couple of times when Inspector Lewis wants to interview someone, how rude they are to him. Now, I know there's a certain Oxford thing going on there and hoity-toity people and all that, but if the murder police come to you and want to talk to you, it seems unlikely that you're going to say, I can give you five minutes. It's just not going to happen. Yet they do that all the time because it creates conflict and it gives you drama and they can't think of anything else to do to have conflict in that scene. And I understand that that's a long running series and got to come up with stuff. But one of the things that I found from making movies was as I learned to write scripts better, I learned from my actors because really good actors, when they walk into a scene, they are going to, if you haven't put it in the script, a good actor will make up 
a reason for why they're there or why they want to leave or what they want. They will put an intention in. They'll create an intention. And if they're working with another great actor, that actor will have their own intention. And if you're lucky, that creates an obstacle between the two. But it really helps if you've written it for them and you've given them that sort of thing. The example I use all the time because it's just a masterclass is just about any scene in the West Wing, seasons one through four, Aaron Sorkin has a thing. He prays at the altar of intention and obstacle. Every character in a scene has an intention. Every character has an obstacle. And if you watch the series, you can see that in every scene. Every character in that scene, even if it, if what they want is not to be in that scene, they have something going on that they want and something that's stopping them from doing it. And it goes from, you know, we're going to... I hope to stop World War III to I wish I could teach the president how to use the intercom system. And it runs that whole gamut. So when you're writing, make sure that everybody in a scene has something they want and something that's stopping them. With my Eli Mark series, it's easy because it's first person. So I always know what Eli wants. And it might be generally if he wants information or he's trying to figure something out. But sometimes it's as simple as he wants a piece of candy out of a bowl and he can't figure out how to get it. Or he wants to get out of a couch it's hard to get out of. But you also have to know what everybody else in the scene wants and what's stopping them. A lot of times with Eli, if he's with his ex-wife, what she wants is for him to go away. You just have to know what everybody wants and what's stopping them from getting it. And like I say, watch, it might be harder to do that in novels and figure that out, how they're doing it. But you watch some procedural detective stories, and you can see immediately how, whether or not they have cleverly set up the tension going on between the people in a scene. And I think the important thing here is you don't always have to reach for like a fight scene. People think nope. conflict has to be war, but it can be uh, emotional war. There doesn't have to be any sort of physical altercation. Or I mean, you are a mystery writer, so you mentioned murder. But I mean, there's plenty of conflict in yep. smaller stories, right? Absolutely. Just think about any uh, family gathering. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's why I like succession. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I just sit there going, oh my goodness, this is just, uh, there's a lot of truth in the family yes. dramas that are the ways that we might have more conflict in our real lives as opposed to like, I write action adventures. So I blow stuff up all the time and I kill people and there are monsters. And that's not actually conflict that I experience in my real life, apparently. <laughs> So, well, let's hope not. Yeah, exactly. Right. So there's so much in the book, but I did want to ask you about endings because you suggest that we like a satisfying ending to a story, which I agree with. But I have heard many authors say their sales figures suggest that readers are more likely to buy the next book if there's a cliffhanger, even if they're complaining as they buy yeah. the next book. So this to me seems like a conflict, as we mentioned. So what are your thoughts on endings? Well, good for them. I'm glad that's happening. I just have to mention the three Fs that you brought up on a recent episode were so helpful for me, the freedom, fortune, or fame. And I'm definitely a freedom guy. So do I care whether or not to read the next book? Yes, I do, but I'm not, I didn't want to, I don't want to provide something unsatisfying to that end. Looking at movies and how we can learn from them, the Back to the Future movies give a perfect example, I think, of how to do a cliffhanger and how not to do a cliffhanger. In Back to the Future 1, Marty returns to present day. Uh, every single emotional beat in the story has been tied up. Every callback has been called back. I have a whole section in the book on the importance of planting callbacks and paying them off, and there's no better example of that in the world of movie scripts than Back to the Future. It's a brilliant script, and they pay everything off. And at the end of the movie, Marty has returned home and everything is, the story has wrapped up to a point where you as an audience member are super satisfied. It was just great because everything tied up very nicely. And then boom, Doc Brown appears. The DeLorean looks a little different. He says, we've got to go. Your kids are in trouble. We've got to go back to the future. And they hop in the car and Marty says, there's not enough road to hit 88 miles an hour. And Doc Brown says, where we're going, we don't need roads. And boom. Says so back, coming soon, back to the future too. That's a perfect cliffhanger ending because you've emotionally satisfied all the beats. The audience is completely happy. And now you've set up, hey, there's going to be another adventure. Would you join us? Now, let's flash ahead to Back to the Future 2. At the end of the movie, Marty's on a dark, deserted road. Everything is lost. 
he can't get where he needs to go. The time machine is broken. A car arrives with a guy from Western Union who says, we've been hanging on to this telegram for 100 years. We were told to deliver it tonight. And Marty opens it and it's from Doc Brown. You have to come back to 18, whatever it is, and help me. And Marty says, oh, my goodness. And he runs down the road to try to find the present day Doc Brown. And it says, to be continued in Back to the Future 3. And when I was in the theater watching it, because that's how old I am, people yelled at the screen some words that I'm not going to use here. They were very upset because that was a bad cliffhanger. We None of the emotional beats had been resolved. It was literally just the first half of a movie, and we didn't tell you it was going to be the first half of a movie. And now you got to watch the second half. And so when you're crafting your cliffhanger, look at it and say, am I doing a Back to the Future 1 or am I doing Back to the Future 2? Another really great example from around that era, maybe a little bit earlier, earlier is the Three Musketeers movie that Richard Lester made, which was going to be one long movie. And they realized that they could stop after about 90 minutes. Everything was pretty well resolved. Mostly D'Artagnan was now part of the group and everything was cool. And they would just take the rest of their footage and make the Four Musketeers, uh, which is its own fine standalone movie. Fine, they didn't even do a cliffhanger. Really, they just said there's more to come and people were fine with it. Everyone was fine with it, except for the actors who'd been paid for one movie. And I think they ended up suing the producer and saying, you have to pay us for two movies. But it was, again, a case where the emotional beats had all been satisfied. The audience was happy and they're okay with a cliffhanger because it just is inviting you to the next adventure. I've only done it once in my writing. I have a new book coming out this summer that's a prequel to my Eli Mark series with Eli at age 13, and it does end with it's 10 chapters. And at the end, I think they're emotionally satisfied. And at the end, he gets a postcard from someone saying, I have an idea for you for an adventure we could go on. I'll tell you more later to be continued. And I, I'll find out if readers are okay with that. But I think I hit all the beats and then tied everything up before I did that. Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, I guess the advice is you just have to judge it by your book. I mean, I try and do this but most of my books they have a proper a proper ending I think I mean I like a proper ending but then I know if a book is in a series like an episodic mystery similar to you but then I also do have a fantasy trilogy my Matt Walker trilogy and that I wrote it as standalone and then it turned into I thought it was a series and then it turned into a trilogy (laughs) which Mm -hmm. is the discovery writer way of doing it and the trilogy each book is fine but the trilogy is a clear sort of clear ending to a character arc so I I don't know I think we just have to figure it out per book and yeah just see what happens along the way and what kind of response we get and maybe it's genre specific as well I think fantasy readers are far more sort of okay with long-running arcs and trilogies and that sort of thing Mm. and particularly if you branded it as book one of three then they kind of know they're in for for three books yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, no, that's interesting. So you mentioned uh, the actors there suing the yeah. the studio. And as we speak, there is still a strike, the screenwriters in the US are striking. And we're, at, I guess, also a point with AI and things where people are really thinking about the fine print of con- contracts. And you do actually have a section in the book on reading the fine print when it comes to all of this. So what are some of the lessons you've learned and how can we make both make the most of our intellectual property because we do need to do deals if possible yeah. but we also need to not screw it up basically <laughs> yeah i know and it can be hard that uh, there was a film called what happened was by a filmmaker named tom noonan tom noonan it would be probably best known as an actor he was the tooth fairy in manhunter which was the first hannibal lecter movie and he's played a lot of villains but he's also a playwright and an actor and he made a little movie called what happened was which was a two-person thing which he did as a play, and then he shot the movie. And he did it very cleverly. And he knew a lot about movies and about distribution. And as he told me, he said, I screwed up. There was one line in the contract for distribution, and I screwed up. And it was a line about who pays the actors when the movie makes money. And normally it's a distributor, and I didn't notice it. And so every time the movie made money, I had to personally pay the The act, there were, he's only the only two actors in the movie, him and another actor, but he had to pay them out of his own pocket. And that's an example of someone who is very knowledgeable about what he's doing, who just screwed up, uh, who didn't have another set of eyes, looked at the contract, thought he knew what he was doing. I'm one of those people who started out with a traditional publisher and then bought everything back and now self published 
throughout. But when I was given my first contract for the Eli Mark series, um, I had sold screenplays at that point, and I had sold other books in the nonfiction world. So I had a pretty good idea of what the contract would look like and what I needed to do with it. And I know there is a lot of bubbly excitement when you get a contract to have somebody publish your book. I mean, it's very exciting. But you have to set all that aside and go, what are they really asking for here? Because in the case of my contract, they were asking for, they wanted a series and they wanted to contract me for three books. And I didn't want to do that. I, I'm a freedom writer. Mm. I wanted to do them when I wanted to do them. I'd spent 30 some years writing professionally and wanted to have control of when I did stuff. They also wanted first writer refusal on my next book. And I change that to you can have first right of refusal on the next book in this series, but not beyond that. And they wanted foreign rights, which I gave them, but I put a cap on it of a couple of years and they didn't do anything with it. So I took that back. When I did my audiobooks, I emailed, let just let them know I'm doing the audiobooks. And they said, well, okay, we'll give you permission to do it. And I emailed back and said, look at the contract. You don't have the rights to the audiobooks. I took those back. Those are mine. So you just need to figure out who, how much you want to give away and think of a publisher like you would think of your book cover designer. Who's going to own what parts of the whole process are you letting them take hold of? And it's hard in that first flush of, oh, my God, I found a publisher, a real publisher who wants to publish my book to set all that aside and go, well, where am I going to be in five years? What am I going to want to do in five years? And look at the contract that way. And probably if you've never done it before, or if it's more than two pages long, hire an attorney who knows something about the book world to look at it. I know many years ago, I was contracted to write a situation comedy for a, 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 our local PBS station. And I was paid, I think, $1,100 to write that script, which is a lot of money back then. And I ended up paying $1,500 to the attorney to get the contract right. And so you go, well, you're down 400. And yes, I was down 400. But if I hadn't done that, the thing I would have missed was that in their version of the contract, it was up to me to make sure all rights on everything everywhere were cleared, which is an easier thing for a TV station to do than it is for me. So yeah, I didn't make any money on it, but it was a much better contract and I was happier going forward. And it also had a revision clause. So I was able to use the sitcom later mm -hmm. on. So it's just a question of, you know, uh, I remember being on a panel at Malice Domestic a couple of years ago, and it was right after lunch and we were sitting there waiting for the people to come in. And there were writers on either side of me. And one said, I just met with my publisher and signed for the next three books. And the other one said, I just met an agent and signed with her. And I thought, I just hope you didn't literally just sign. I, I'm <laughs> glad you're excited, but please sit on it for a while and think about it and look at it. Because the movie world is full of examples of people who didn't read the fine print and regretted it forever. Yeah. Well, just to recommend another book, Hollywood versus the author. I don't know if you've seen that mm -hmm. one. It's an excellent book full of some pretty famous authors and some yeah. pretty big mistakes that they made. But just to mention there on the agent, one of the first um, agents who offered me a contract, basically, it was years ago now, and it was in my early days, earlier days of self-publishing. And the agency contract was, we will take a percentage of all your self-published work. Ooh. as well as the books that they wow. sold because their opinion was they were building my brand yeah. therefore they would get every, a percentage of everything under my brand and I was like uh no that clause needs to be removed and they wouldn't remove it so and even though it was really early on and I hadn't really made much money as an indie I was so I was confident that I could make this into a business so yeah. I didn't sign that deal but it's so funny sometimes I do think about it because I know some of the other authors they represent who've done incredible well and you do wonder don't you but like you said it's about freedom but I I did want to ask you in terms of just coming back to the low budget thing that you said earlier this is a really interesting thing 
Because I did pitch my Matt Walker series at a screenwriting thing to an agent. And he said, look, this this idea is very, very expensive. That what mm-hmm. the project you're talking about is super expensive. You should pitch something that would be cheaper. So yeah. given that you've done these budget movies, like why is this important? And how can we write books that could be turned into cheaper movies? <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, that was then, this is now because of the use of CGI and green screen and things that used to be really, really expensive aren't as much anymore. You can do big movies all in a studio. And if look, look at the hunger games, hunger games is an expensive proposition. Yet a studio had no problem poning up the money to do that. And the reason they didn't have any problem doing it was it was a hit book. And, And this is one of the few areas I think where being a traditional publisher makes life a little easier for an author if you're trying to get a movie or a series made out of your book, which is that big publishers have departments that all they do is they sell rights and they look for deals like that. And it's much, much harder to do if you're on your own and, and you know an independent author and how do you get how do you get it out there? But as with the Hunger Games, as with Harry Potter, as with Louise Penny having done Three Pines recently. What they're looking for, uh, the cost of doing it is secondary. It might even be tertiary, might be way way down the list, is how pre-sold is this idea? How well-known is this property? Because they want it already marketable. They want to just tag on to existing fans with it. There's a Steve Martin had a joke. Uh, in his early act that said, I'm going to, I'm going to teach you how not to pay taxes on a million dollars. First, get a million dollars. And the same thing is true here. I'm going to teach you how to make your best selling book into a movie. First, write a best selling book. And that's really kind of the most likely path is the more popular your book is, the more likely someone's going to be interested in taking it and making it into a movie. However, There are ways around that in the movie world. And I'll just recount one example, which was there was a filmmaker who had written a script for the actor Campbell Scott. Campbell Scott is the the son of George C. Scott and Colleen Dewhurst, and an excellent actor in his own right. And he'd written a great little low low budget independent movie called Roger Dodger. And it was perfect for Campbell Scott, but he had no way of getting a hold of Campbell Scott. And agents don't generally want to forward stuff for things that aren't going to make them a lot of money. But he lived in New York and he knew that Campbell Scott lived in New York and he just carried that script with him everywhere. And one day in a coffee shop, he ran into Campbell Scott and he struck up a conversation and he said, I've written the script just for you. And he handed him the script and Campbell Scott read it and said, let's make this movie. So if you've written something for someone specific in mind, if you can get to them, that might be a path. But the most surefire direct path is write a best-selling book and they'll come knocking at your door. I know there's all kinds of scams online for pay us and we'll get your book in front of producers who want to make movies out of it. Those are scams. Doesn't work that way. Absolutely doesn't work that way. But if you know someone or know a way of getting to someone who might have some interest, by all means approach them. But it it really is on that scale of a fame, fortune, or freedom. I think you really have to have the fame value strong to want to go on that path because you really have to get a best-selling book out there to get that kind of interest. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I we had Johnny B. Truant on a few months ago now, and he was talking about his book, Fat Vampire, that's become Reginald the Vampire, which I think has got renewed for a second series. <laughs> and that is an example of an idea situation where some dude was looking at Apple books and saw this and the title really caught him. So that was an idea book and they didn't really, he didn't really have any relationship, but eventually made yep. it into that but it's such a lightning strike yeah. situation isn't it i mean even if you have a best selling but not all best selling books get made right. into tv shows or films so yeah it's kind of interesting the other thing you mentioned about knowing people so i've had people say to me oh you should come to can you know come along to can you go to the parties you meet people and i'm like yeah i'm an introvert <laughs> that's really not going to happen but 
<laughs> it's so funny. So I guess the, the question is, should one just give up the dream or and just focus on trying to make our books sell better? You know, I think that's the way to go. However, if it's that important to you, if that's what you want to do is get your book into that lane, then put all your energy into that. But there's also a flip side to that. And I'll go back to Louise Penny on that because I heard her speak somewhere and she was talking about the first time she sold the rights to her Three Pines series. And it was a heartbreaking story because the people who bought it didn't understand it. They didn't know what they bought. They didn't understand the Three Pines is driven by those people, those characters. And what they made was not what she had written and it sort of broke her heart. Although obviously the books are still there and I'm sure the money helped. The books, the money probably <laughs> helped a little up to it. I don't know if, I don't know if, if how much, uh, how large a check you'd need to write to, to make Louise Penny impressed at this point, <laughs> but you need to keep that in mind. The Reginald the Vampire story is a great example because he's talked about how he was invited to the set and got to see some stuff and they did run the scripts by him. But his first objection was, I don't like the title. And they said, yeah, well, sorry, that's the title we're using. And it's going to be like that throughout the whole process, If you, you, unless you are someone who, like Dennis Lehane, who is a novelist and a screenwriter and can become the showrunner on something he's written and can really shepherd it through, you're going to be handing it off to people who probably 50-50 chance they're going to be in the same wavelength as you and what you see up on the screen is not necessarily what you thought it was going to be. Yeah, but I mean, on the other side of that, I heard Lee Child talking about the first Reacher movie with Tom Cruise, and he had to talk about this so many times because, of course, Jack Reacher is mm. like six foot four, whatever <laughs> it is, six foot seven, and Tom Cruise is not. And Lee Child basically said, look, whatever, mm -hmm. selling more and more of yep. my books. And then the TV show of Reacher is fantastic. The character is exactly right. But I do want to come back on, on this because, we, like you said, that was then, this is now, that agent said to me, you should write something cheaper, like a low-budget horror movie. And hilariously, my new novella, it's a long novella, Catacomb, is, is exactly that. It's a low-budget horror monster book. And so I'm really thinking about it because it's very visual. And mm -hmm. with AI, we've got these wonderful tools coming out at the moment we've got obviously mid journey and i'm doing loads of images in mid journey adobe firefly and also runway ml i don't know if you've seen this which is generative uh, text to video so generative video is now a thing now you mentioned making low budget movies and now people are doing that putting them on youtube and what do you think about book trailers or short films that then kind of advertise a book do you think that's going to be a way to go or are we looking at a future where it just splinters everything splinters so much i think that's a great way to go what screenwriters today are facing and the pandemic had a little something to do with this is that when they go into pitch a screenplay now to a studio or a producer they are expected to have a deck and to talk through the project with a deck with visuals to really bring it to life that's new that they didn't used to have to do that and now it's kind of expected but it helps because sometimes when you're talking to people at the other side of the table, they are not necessarily the most creative or most imaginative. And if you can show them, here's what the sky city is going to look like, or here's an idea what it looked like, and here's what the monster looked like coming out of the lake. Well, at that point, in their mind, the movie's done. Yeah, that's perfect. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. And if you can do the same thing with your own book and do a trailer, I, I had a short story in the Eli Mark series that I had turned into a comic book because it was kind of perfect for a comic book. And I realized I had essentially what's called an animatic that all the frames of what would have been the movie, except nothing moved, but I was able to make moves on them and make it look like a semi little animated movie. And that's a great way to sell the Eli Mark series. People get into it by going, Oh, I see what he looks like. And I see what his magic store looks like. And I get the sense of humor. And the guy who did the audiobooks did the voice. And so they're hearing what is now the voice of Eli Marks in everyone's mind is my narrator. And it, I can certainly see after I finished taking your course next week on how to do this, <laughs> trying to create something a little more elaborate with AI to help pull people into the Eli Mark series, whether it's just getting them to read the book or listen to the podcast or hear the book. And maybe someone will get excited and say, hey, that would make a great series. 
Yeah. And it's so funny because it's much easier for people to imagine something if you give them a visual. I mean, that's why book covers are so important. But the reality that none of these agents or film people, they're not going to read the book. (laughs) I mean, they might not even read it ever. I mean, it might just be something that goes into the script machine and then comes out the other end as a script as opposed to the book that they read. And I feel like we get too romanticized around the book itself as the only thing that can communicate our ideas. Whereas sometimes, like you mentioned, a pitch deck um, Mm -hmm. with some slides and some visuals, that can be a much better way. So yeah, I, I do feel like authors need to try and turn their books into more images in order to get the attention if if film and tv is something people care about because of course it's a visual medium right <laughs> right but one one thing i would warn them about with ai and i've seen a couple different posts on this is now you can take your book and put it into the this program and it will turn it into a screenplay um and it's it's not going to turn your book into a screenplay. It's going to take your words and put them in a screenplay format. Yeah, exactly. I totally but agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> when Emma Thompson wrote her version of Sense and Sensibility, I remember her saying, somebody said, well, you had this book to start with. And she said, well, yes, but if there's more than three lines of dialogue in the finished movie that are in the book, I'd be surprised because in order to go from the page to the screen, and as an experiment a couple of years ago, because it was COVID, there's nothing going on. I took the first book in my series and thought, if this were a streaming series, what would the first season be like if it's just this first book? And I took the first book, which is called The Ambitious Card, and I broke it into five episodes and did kind of a beat sheet on it. And then I sat down and thought, I will write the pilot. I'll just see what that 60-page script looks like. And yes, it's the story. You bet it's the same story. Is the dialogue the same? It is not. Wouldn't work in the Mm. screen. Are the scenes the same length? They are not. There's to make that leap. It might help if you have a third person novel, it makes it a little bit easier, but you still have to make everything visual. I mean, everything visual. I, I remember reading a script once from a student, and there was a line in it something like, um, Our main character crosses the street thinking about going to the laundry. Like, well, <laughs> yeah. okay, how do we do that? How do we do that? The, the degree of changes you have to make just to kind of even still make it the same as the book are enormous. It isn't just an easy leap from the page to the screen. No, absolutely. I went down the rabbit hole of screenwriting a few years back and decided in the end that it is basically a job that yeah. I wouldn't want to do. And what I want to do, again, maybe the freedom aspect is I would love to license my books for film, TV, whatever, but I'm not going to write the script. I won't even try. And in fact, someone even said to me the other day, I think it would be easier for us to pitch this if you write a draft of the script. And I was like, no, I'm absolutely yeah. not yeah. going to do that. Because like you said, it's an ad- adaptation and I feel like we're too close to the material to adapt it well whereas someone coming in from the outside can just look at it and go well chuck that change that do that the other so uh, definitely adaptation rather than just straight use AI to turn it into a thing I totally agree with you there yeah that's not going to work and one of the things I realized in my 20s because like I said I I was very fortunate I live in Minneapolis Minnesota middle of nowhere well it's nice but it's But I got to study every week with this fantastic screenwriting teacher who world-renowned respected. He just happened to be teaching at a college here for a year and learning from him how to write a screenplay. And I spent the next few years writing what are called spec screenplays. Here's something I could sell. Here's something I could sell. And quickly realized that just because you've written a screenplay and you're trying to sell it doesn't mean it'll ever sell. And even if it does sell, doesn't mean they're going to make it. Mm. And it's such a long process. And I just went, you know, I used to make these myself. Why don't I take what I think is my best spec script, rewrite it so I can do it for $30,000, get all my actor friends together and over four weekends, we'll shoot it. And it's just the, the, like I say, the process for Becoming a novelist and screenwriter are the same. You you can either keep asking people to do this thing. Hey, would you do this? Would you publish this? Would you represent me? Would you, would you, would you? Or you can go, I'm just going to do it myself. And that's what I want to do is make the thing. I don't want to, I don't need to have a, a book that's on the bestseller list. I just like a book where I occasionally get an email from readers saying, is there another one? I really want to read another one. 
Yeah, we're we're fun creatives. We just can't help ourselves creating more stuff, which is awesome. So the book is great. Where can people find you and all of your books and everything you do <laughs> online? Well, you can find the popcorn principles and just about everything at our book website, which is called albertsbridgebooks.com. That's albertsbridgebooks.com. And you can listen to the Eli Marks podcast where you can hear every season has a different book. You hear the whole audiobook plus interviews with cool people like Dick Cavett and the amazing Kreskin and Teller of Penn and Teller and people like that. And that's called Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, John. That was great. Thank you. So I hope you found the discussion with John interesting and that it gave you some ideas for your books. Next Monday, I'm talking with the lovely Rachel Heron, who many of you will know from her podcast, How Do You Write? And also just an all round, wonderfully encouraging creative person. We're talking about publishing options, since Rachel has just sold her latest novel to a big traditional publisher, but she's also indie with other books, is planning a Kickstarter and has a Patreon for her essays. She uses pretty much every publishing route, so we talk about that and more. So happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>